Thanks. Uh, according to the National Federation of Credit Counseling, uh, about one out of every three Americans could come up with $1,000 on a month's notice, about one in three. Okay, so that implies, for those of you who are math people, that two out of every three folks, if they need to come up with a couple hundred bucks in a couple weeks, couldn't do it. Okay? We are all in the one third. Right? Who are the two third? These are people who every day live essentially paycheck to paycheck. If anything goes wrong, they don't have savings to fall back on, so what do they do? These are not people buying houses. I'm not talking about subprime mortgages and global meltdowns here. I am not talking about people buying flat screen TVs. I'm talking about people who are a little bit short on their rent. I'm talking about people who need a little extra money to pay for their heart medicine. And I'm talking about people like my sister-in-law, Vic. My sister-in-law is a single mother of three. She holds a full-time job and is a full-time student. For those of you who have families, you can imagine how incredibly hard that is. It's just not human. So uh, at some point, I was sitting outside, my phone rang, and I was Vic. I picked it up and said, hey, what's up, Vic? She says, I have a flat tire. I was like, too bad, sorry to be you. She's like, no, no, I need to get to work today, and I don't have the money to buy new tires. Okay, fine, so I loaned her the money to buy new tires. And that same National Federation of Credit Counseling survey, about 17% of people would be able to ask their family for a few hundred bucks, right? So 33 plus 17 is roughly 50. That means half of all Americans, when faced with a short-term credit crunch, a life surprise, if you will, are gonna have to fall back on some sort of credit. Now again, I'm not talking about mortgages here, I'm talking about people who need to pay the deductible for their child's NICU stay. By the way, all the examples I'm using today are real examples. I'm not making these up. So, what, if you're trying to find a few hundred bucks afloat, if you will, how would you do it? Well, I'm sure all of you are instantly thinking, well, come on, just get a subprime credit card. Uh, because, good Lord, you can't turn on the TV and not see one of those Capital One Viking ads, right? I mean, it's impossible. <laughs> so, it's interesting, though, if you look at actually the subprime market, you see this very bizarre configuration. Up near, very, very at the top, with really almost prime credit, you see subprime credit cards like Capital Ones, which will publish that they're charging 1399 to 1699% APR, and are actually yielding gross yields of more like 80% because of late fees. But if you're one step below that, just slightly below that, you're pushed all the way down to pawn loans and payday loans, where gross yields are between 700 and 800%. What kind of a weird market is it that starts at 80 and in one step takes you to 700? That doesn't make any sense. That market is not clearing for some reason. Why is it not clearing? It's not clearing because of history. In the early 1970s, the world was transformed in an amazingly positive way. In 1960, if you wanted to get credit, you would go to a bank, you would sit across from a banker who was uniformly male, and you would try to convince him that you were a good credit risk. And he would just try to guess and then make a decision, and oftentimes that decision was no. During the 60s and early 70s, the credit bureaus got better and better and better at standardizing the information that was in them. And the folks at Fair Isaac said, hey, we could build score, a uniform score, based on these, uh, these attributes. And as a result, we could make credit wildly more available. They changed the world, they transformed the industry. Suddenly credit was available to a lot of people. However, as is so often the case, in their victory, were the seeds of their failure. Specifically, they rely on consistent information in a credit bureau file in order to make this credit decision score, in order to form a FICO score. The problem is, most people who are in subprime credit are there because either they're missing credit options, their kids or whatever, or they have bad credit. Right? They have a bankruptcy, they have a missed payment, something. As a result, it's actually, FICO is pretty unstable in the subprime credit space, because lots of things change very, very rapidly, so your score's not steady. Our scores are pretty steady, not true in the subprime space, which means that it's actually quite difficult to figure out whether I should give you credit or not, because FICO is largely non-predictive, right? A higher FICO score does not necessarily predict lower likelihood of default in a short-term loan. So why is it that we're sticking with FICO? We built FICO in a time when data storage was very hard and very expensive. And computation was exceptionally challenging to get. So we built this underwriting model using math called logistic regression, which is sort of stats 101. 
But the cool, and it can handle like between four and ten pieces of data before it breaks down. Logistic regression, four to ten pieces of data. The cool thing about that is you can compute it on a calculator. Or you don't need a computer, right? You, I mean, if you can take logarithms in your head, you can do it on paper. It's simple. I cannot, and if you can, you probably shouldn't be here. Um, so not those two constraints that led us to the underwriting models we have today are both false, right? Storage is free. How much does, you know, how many terabytes does it cost to stick stuff in S3? Computation is essentially ubiquitous, right? Almost, I can see, it looks like maybe a third of you are currently taking notes on iPads or laptops. You're taking notes on machines that could do this computation. But what's really exciting in the last few years is as we've had the ability to store essentially all the world's information, sorry for the quick, quick lift of Google's mission statement, and we've been able to throw computation at all that data, a bunch of new methods, a bunch of new machine learning methods, a bunch of new data mining methods have emerged that can handle huge amounts of data. So we use more than 200 signals when I was at Google to rank order web pages. Amazon uses hundreds of variables to, to remind you that if you just bought this zombie apocalypse book, you're probably gonna like that zombie apocalypse book. <laughs> and you know you have all bought a zombie apocalypse book. And if you haven't, Please do so today because you never know when it's coming. <laughs> so, you, we could, there are all these techniques that allow for kind of messy data, right? So suddenly, people who are young maybe can get credit because although they don't have exactly the set of things you'd expect to see in a credit file, they have other stuff, right? And maybe some of this other stuff is missing and maybe some of it's wrong, et cetera, but you, there are really good new ways to transform and clean data. There are these new algorithms, they're not that new relatively anymore, but they're new to the credit space that are, you know, that are able to deal with these huge amounts of data. We're stuck in FICO land because credit officers across the world, across the globe, understand FICO land. Right? So we're computing a number which is simply fundamentally wrong. It's the wrong number. And we're doing it because we're afraid or we don't know how to use all data as credit data. It turns out that there are hundreds of sources of data trivially available on the net. And thousands if you include things like web crawls, et cetera. And if your view is that all data is credit data, you build a piece of mathematics, or in our case, a whole bunch of different mathematics, it consumes thousands of data points. And of those thousand, many are missing, many are wrong, et cetera. But regardless, you build a score. And then suddenly you build a score that allows you to figure out people who are maybe not quite good enough to get a subprime credit card, but are way better credit risk than the payday loan guys, right? So instead of offering them a 700% APR product, you can offer them something in between, right? And this is sort of a cool side effect. Imagine it works. You know, close your eyes and imagine a world in which subprime credit is not dominated by FICO, but is actually dominated by your behavior where subprime credit is not dominated by little short functions that you can compute on a calculator, and it's dominated by really deep, rich understandings of you as a person, kind of akin to what happened in the 1950s when you sat across the table from that banker, but differently because that banker wasn't paying attention to thousands and thousands of things. That banker didn't care whether you were on a prepaid cell or a postpaid cell. That banker didn't care whether you were a month late on your rent or not. That banker was doing his best, and again, uniformly it was a he. We have all that data and more, so we can capture the benefits of the sort of across the table banker folks with the access advantages of FICO into a world where we can build actual risk models and priced credit against those risk models so that you know that if you're a better credit risk, you should be charged less. That's a credit availability problem, credit availability solution. And if you get it right, all of a sudden, perhaps the big financial institutions will be able to re-enter this market, right? We can put pricing pressure on the payday loan guys to lower their prices and the pawn line goes, guys to lower their prices. We can get additional capital into the market because larger financial institutions will be able to manage their risk. They'll know what their exposure is. And again, we're not talking about mortgage years, right? I'm not talking about having yet another global financial meltdown. I'm talking about helping somebody buy tires. I'm talking about helping somebody whose child overspent at college and as a result can't pay the monthly tuition and is going to get kicked out of college because he decided to buy a, a sweatshirt and a hat. 
I'm talking about people who are your nurses, right, who are taking care of your kids, who are driving the buses that brought you all here, except I guess no one rides the bus in Silicon Valley, so anyway, hypothetically, that you could have written here. If we can get appropriate credit scores, we can get the big players back in. If we can get the big players back in, we can transform the space and create new credit models. I've been standing on stage now for roughly 11 minutes. I'm 12, so I'm waiting. In 11 minutes, in the last 11 minutes, there have been 12,000 payday loans made. In the last 11 minutes, there have been 12,000 payday loans made. In the last 11 minutes, there have been 7,000 pawn loans made. It's pawn loan. I took my watch to a pawn store, I gave it to the person behind the pawn counter. They gave me a very small amount of money. On average, a $400 watch gets you about 30 bucks. And then, of course, if you don't reclaim the property, they sell it off. Pawn loans are spectacularly effective business. So the question is, how do we use really advanced mathematics? How do we use ubiquity of computation? And how do we use ubiquity of storage to make it possible for folks who really have real capital? Bank of America, are you listening? Wells Fargo, are you listening? People who have real capital to help my sister. It's not fair that Vic could call me and I could help her and the other 29,999,999 people who took out payday loans in the last year don't have that right. We can truly transform Wall Street and truly transform our society by helping that other 29 million people. Thank you so much.